It was called the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, a new independent agency created by President Woodrow Wilson in 1915. Its job, make the United States a world leader in the field of aeronautics. In less than three decades, these early pioneers in aviation and those who followed would be called upon to think through problems a million miles away and do it with boldness and vision. By the mid-1950s, NACA had modern wind tunnels and was moving into the area of rocket and satellite research. Then on October 7, 1957, the U.S. and the rest of the world were greeted by the sounds of Sputnik 1. The Soviet Union had placed the first artificial satellite into orbit. It would not be until early the following year that America's satellite, Explorer 1, successfully orbited the Earth and discovered a dense belt of radiation surrounding our planet. Who would have believed at this early stage that we would one day move outward from the thin ribbon of Earth's atmosphere to the very edge of our solar system and beyond? Project Mercury, the country's first manned spaceflight program, was given the go-ahead just one week after NASA was formed on October 1st, 1958. Seven test pilots were selected to become astronauts. Donald K. Deke Slayton. Alan B. Shepard. Walter M. Shira. Virgil I. Gus Grissom. John H. Glenn, Jr. Leroy Gordon Cooper and Malcolm Scott Carpenter. The seven new astronauts spent months and months undergoing rigorous testing and training. they were being trained, several monkeys took check rides in the new Mercury spacecraft. the orbiting of unmanned satellites became more and more commonplace. And weather watchers like Tyros found a permanent place in our daily lives by improving weather forecasting capabilities. On August 12, 1960, President Eisenhower took part in the first transmission of the Echo-1 communications satellite. This is President Eisenhower speaking. It is a great personal satisfaction to participate in this first experiment in communications involving the use of the satellite balloon known as Echo. On May 5, 1961, Astronaut Alan B. Shepard made America's first suborbital flight. Project Mercury was underway. Two, one, zero. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. 
This is Freedom 7. The fuel is go 1.2G. Cabin at 14 PSI. Oxygen is go. Cabin pressure is holding at 5.5. Soon after Freedom 7 landed, President John Kennedy gave NASA an ambitious new space goal. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win, and the others too. After Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom's test flights, four other American astronauts orbited the Earth in Mercury spacecraft, starting with John Glenn. He was followed by Scott Carpenter, Wally Schirra, and Gordon Cooper. As NASA geared up to respond to the lunar commitment, it became clear that new management techniques for handling far-flung systems manufacture and final integration would have to be developed. Clear also was the fact that state-of-the-art electronics and computers would be pushed to the limit. Unknowns about the moon were numerous. Such things as whether an astronaut would sink into dust over his head were a real concern. Lunar impact studies like these were carried out in an attempt to learn. Researchers fired projectiles simulating meteors hitting the moon into sand-like and rocky materials and then measured how much material was thrown out by the impact. This animation shows how scientists believe the huge crater Tycho was formed on the moon, a crater 54 miles wide. A series of picture-taking Ranger spacecraft slammed into the moon. <laughs> 